Howdy, folks. This is just a reminder that if you like this content, you can help me out by liking, commenting, and especially subscribing to the video. And be sure to hit the bell notification when you do so that you always get notified whenever I have a new video out, whether it's Mysterious World or something else. These days, I usually have several videos out a week. Hope you enjoy this. Hello, folks. Today, we are sitting down with Jimmy Aiken to debrief his two recent debates with Reformed Baptist and Christian apologist James White. Thanks, Jimmy, for joining me for this debrief on these super interesting exchanges. It's, it's great to have you here. Yeah, thank you. It's my pleasure. So let's dive right in. What were these debate topics, and how did the debate topics come about? Well, a few months ago, um, I got a request through Catholic Answers where First Baptist Church in Livingston, Louisiana, had uh, contacted them, wanting to know if I would debate James White on uh, the subject of how does a man find peace with God. And I'm happy to debate that subject, but I've wanted to debate uh, James on Sola Scriptura for some time. So I said, well, I'd do it if... Uh, uh, if we can debate Sola Scriptura also, and they said yes. Uh, so that's how the basic topics came up. Um, James himself then picked the resolutions uh, for the two debates. He His initial resolution for the Sola Scriptura debate was something like, um, Scripture is the only infallible rule of faith for the Church. And that's kind of a minimalist understanding of Sola Scriptura that doesn't really capture fully what Sola Scriptura does in the Protestant Church. And so I propose that we that we reframe it as something like God wants Christians to use Sola Scriptura that didn't, you know, that was a little more neutral in terms of exactly what Sola Scriptura means, and then that's something we could both talk about our understandings of. And uh, we proposed that, and the, the message we got back was that, nope, it, it, James will not debate an incorrect definition of Sola Scriptura. And, well, the resolution I proposed didn't even have a definition of Sola Scriptura in it, so that was a bit of a non sequitur. But I said, well, I'll, I'll work with it, because all I had to do was quote what, what, what James's definition is missing, is the idea that Scripture is sufficient for all of Christian doctrine. But he talks about that in his book, The Roman Catholic Controversy. So all I had to do was just quote a passage where he hammers that point, and he either has to deny his own words and say, I've changed my mind, or he has to let it slide. And he let it slide. So that was fine. The other one was he proposed a kind of kitchen sink definition for the resolution of the peace debate, which really I knew was going to end up being a justification debate. Um, but basically, it was something to the effect, I, I may not get this word for word right because I don't have it in front of me, but it was basically that um, we find peace with God through the imputed righteousness of Christ, which is given to us by his finished work by grace through faith alone. So it's basically, um, basically the idea of we get peace by fulfilling these when these four conditions are fulfilled, and that makes it a little unwieldy if you're debating four specific subpoints. But you know, I, I I realized it was possible to do, and so I didn't have a problem with that. Also, the um, in the communications with First Baptist, uh, the there was some it was kind of interesting because they said we'd both in the second debate we'd both be taking the affirmative position for our preferred <laughs> view which is not at all typical of yeah that's debate. actually what i was just going to ask is who had the burden of proof in each debate so that is very atypical to have two affirmatives yeah and so you know since they had proposed resolutions i even though we're somehow both going to argue positively in the second one, um, I uh, we still had a resolution, and so I said, well, okay, James picked these resolutions. He agrees with both of them, so he needs to go first. You know, he, he's the one who agrees that Sola Scripture is the sole infallible rule of faith for the Church, so he needs to he needs to he's take, clearly taking the affirmative on that. I am taking the negative, 
Um, and so he needs to go first and I'll go second. In the second one, he proposed this other resolution that he agrees with, and we're both supposed to argue for what we believe. So, well, okay, he, he picked the resolution. He ought to go first in, in advocating it. And then, well, it so happens I agree with a correct understanding of the resolution. So then I'll argue for that correct understanding. And we're going to get into a lot of that when we discuss the second debate, because your approach was very unique and, and interesting. But just a couple more stage setting questions, mm -hmm. because many people, when they go to a debate or maybe even expect to see at a debate, you know, the participants, they wear traditional suits, ties or formal attire. Mm -hmm. And White commented briefly on this in his own debrief of the debate. Mm -hmm. Is there any significance to your chosen attire? No, it's just my uh, it, it's just my my look uh when i uh, for years uh when i when i give public speeches i have a kind of i have a white jacket and white pants and my shirt color may change sometimes it's white sometimes it's purple in fact i used a white shirt in the first night and a purple shirt in the second night and then i also tend to wear a white hat and that's just that's just my look that's my my style and so i've done that when i speak at catholic answers conferences i dress that way when i debated bart ehrman i dress that way when i debated james white i dress that way there's there's no particular significance it's just the way i look i did note that in his debrief uh james said you know he mentioned like ties and uh, it, he, he kind of mischaracterized uh, just a little bit uh, what I was wearing. He said I was wearing like white jeans and they're actually not jeans. They are slacks. Um, but he, and he mentioned I'm not wearing a tie and, but he correctly noted, I mean, with a beard like this, who's going to see it? So yeah, I don't wear ties. If I did wear a tie, it'd be a bolo tie, but nobody's going to see it anyway. That's it. It's Jimmy Aiken's unique look. I, I know you're not a huge sports guy, but a lot of athletes have like a unique look to them. There's a, uh -huh. you know, I grew up in the nineties when Tiger Woods was making his, you know, debut on Sunday in golf championships, he would always wear a red shirt and black pants. And that just became the thing like that Sunday Tiger Woods. So a lot of, you know, mm -hmm. people have their own unique looks and this is Jimmy Akins. Very good. So as we, as we get towards the content here, still setting the stage a little bit more, what were some of your goals in these two debates and what overall attitude did you want to display? Well, in terms of goals, you know, I wanted to mount a robust defense of the positions that I was going to argue. Uh, I wanted to, um, I wanted in, in the case of the Sola Scriptura debate, I wanted to show that Sola Scriptura is false. Um, it, it simply fails to meet its own test. I, in the second debate, I wanted to show that actually we can we can agree on this statement, provided we properly understand it, and that means that the Catholic Church is not teaching a false gospel, because, you know, White has said, and I quoted him saying this, that the Catholic Church is under the condemnation from Galatians 1 of teaching a false gospel, but uh, actually, if we agree on this resolution, then it makes it really hard to claim that Catholics teach a false gospel. And so that's what I wanted to hammer home for the audience on the content side of the debate. In terms of, uh, in, in terms of the delivery side of the debates, I wanted to make sure that I communicated clearly, and I also wanted to make sure that I came across as warm and friendly and looking like I'm having a good time in the debates. Um, because, uh, you know, that'll, that'll win a more receptive hearing from the audience. Uh, I think that James tends, if I can put it this way, he tends not to prioritize those things. Uh, he does not come across in debates as friendly and approachable and looking like he's having a good time. He tends to come across, he tends to come across as kind of grouchy and, uh, and hostile at times. And so uh, I didn't want to convey that kind of impression to the audience. I always want to be as winning as I can. I'm here to, uh, I, I take seriously, you know, the, um, the love ethic that Christ taught us. And while there are times where love means being abrupt, as Jesus himself showed us, that's not the default for love. And so consequently, I want to be, I want to come across as loving as I can while still standing up for the truth. I think that's important for us to hear, too. Uh, those of us who are interested in apologetics, want to do evangelism, perhaps our own dialogues and debates, prioritizing and thinking about mm 
how we come across is is also important in, in, in junction in conjunction with the content. Maybe if we're just so focused on content, so laser beam focused on arguments, and we let that fall by the wayside, our arguments may not get the hearing uh, that we want them to have. So well, let's actually talk a little bit more stage setting, though, because I want to talk preparation, because this obviously okay. took um, a good amount of preparation. Mm -hmm. And in 2022, you had a high profile debate with Bart Ehrman on the reliability of the Gospels. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you had to prepare a lot for that debate, too. So I wanted to springboard it like this. How was your preparation for these debates similar to or different from the preparation for the Ehrman debate? Well, there's a certain amount of debate preparation that kind of happens no matter who you're debating or what you're debating. For example, um, you always want to research, you know, what your opponent's views are so you know how to best interact with them. And so in Ehrman's case, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd been familiar with him for a long time, just like I'd been familiar with James White for a long time. But in prepping for the debate, uh, with Ehrman, I, you know, read a bunch of his books that were on topic. I looked at previous debates that he had done, and I did the same thing in prepping for this one. Uh, James White has written a number of books. Uh, the one I used most heavily in prepping for this debate was his, a book he published in 1996 called The Roman Catholic Controversy. And I also watched a bunch of debates that um, that he did on either the exact topics that were we were discussing or ones that were similar to them because like for example he he didn't have any debates with Catholics on this peace question how do you get peace with God he did have peace debates with Muslims on that question but I, I and I, I looked at those but they really he was going to have to completely reframe the argument to to deal with to interact with catholics so those weren't really helpful so i instead looked at justification debates that he had done and i looked at other things like i looked at an interview he did on the unbelievable podcast with, where he was kind of sparring with nt wright and as i did this i did the same thing i did for bart ehrman which was i looked for quotations where my opponent concedes things that are important to the subject of the debate and then i'll bring those up in the debate and say you know he agreed with this and he agreed with that and here's what he said about this and that effectively will move the debate forward in terms of now we don't have to argue about this unless the person wants to retract it you know if he wants to retract what he says previously then we do need to note that but then the burden is on him to explain why he retracted this view and why we should no longer adhere to what he previously said um, which weakens his case so to the extent possible um, I always want to use points of agreement with my opponent and uh, use his prior writings. And that was really the core of what I did with Bart Ehrman, you know, um, yes. I, I, because he had written extensively on the exact issue we were, uh, we were debating in a way, we were debating the reliability of the Gospels. And in his publications, he admits point after point where the Gospels are reliable. Mm -hmm. And so it's only fair to bring those up. In James's case, um, it wasn't quite the same, but the same principle was in play. So I would gather quotations from James from prior things he'd, he'd either uh, written or said and use exact quotations from him in prepping my debate materials. Now, some people have remarked, uh, including I thought this too, that you had an especially strong performance during the cross-examination periods. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, how did you plan for those specifically? Well, one of the flaws that I see a lot of debaters doing in cross-examination is they, I'm not sure if they're winging it or what, but they're not, you know, coming up with questions on the fly. It, they may be doing that. But even if they're not, they're not they're not really doing good priority. They're not doing good prioritization of what to bring up, because in cross examination, you want to make the strongest case you can against your opponent. You want to force your opponent to admit uncomfortable things from his position, and um, and the, and you want them to be on the central topic, not peripheral topics. Mm -hmm. You know, like, for example, in the Sola Scriptura debate, um, which is about the subject of Sola Scriptura, 
if I were James White, I would be pressing me, Jimmy Aiken, on top level issues. But what he did instead was he like brought up fiducia supplicants. And okay, fiducia supplicants is not an infallible document. It has it 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 it, it is very low down actually on the um, on the spectrum of doctrinal authority. And and so it really doesn't engage our central issue of how do we develop Christian doctrine. This is a, a you know a very subsidiary level thing. It's not the core of <clears throat> of scripture tradition in the magisterium. And so you know he, I didn't think he in his in his cross examination of me I thought that. You know, I was happy to answer his questions, but I didn't think they were on matters of substance uh, because they don't go to the core of the issue. There's a difference and a big difference between debating the principles. You know, should is the principle we should use scripture alone, or is the principle we should use scripture tradition in the magisterium? That's the top level discussion that we're here to debate. Mm -hmm. We're not here to debate individual things that fall out of those two approaches. And so, so I thought that's an example of something that I, if I were him, I would not have chosen to bring up. He did chose to choose to bring it up, presumably because he wanted to embarrass me with something from the Pope that, you know, he, he doesn't like and so forth. Um, but it's still, it's not a central issue. Mm -hmm. So what I do in prepping for, um, in prepping for, Across examination periods is I will, and I just do it on my phone, but in my notes function, I sit down and I, I type a whole bunch of questions and then I go through them and prioritize them in terms of which go to the core of the issue. And, and I put those right up at the top. Because I know in a 10-minute cross-examination, I think the debate would have benefited if we'd had more than 10 minutes for cross-examination. But in a 10-minute cross-examination, you are not going to get to everything. So what you have to be clear about ahead of time is what are the most important things to get on the table and put those right at the top of your list of questions because you're, un you're not going to get through all the questions you've got. Um, and you've got to get the most important ones out first. And also what I try to do is think in terms of what's the natural flow of the mm. questions. So what will lead to what? You know, this is, it's essentially wargaming where you're trying to think, well, if he says this is his answer, how do I respond? If he says this is his answer, how do I respond? And so particularly for the second debate, the justification debate, um, I, had a t I had kind of an algorithm of what I was going to ask, where I knew my, what my initial question is going to be. And if he gives answer A, here's my follow-up. If he gives answer B, here's my follow-up. And so I had th this kind of decision tree mentally of what follows from what and with, you know, trying to arrange so that none of the none of the termini, none of the end points of the line of questioning end well for him. He either has to admit something he doesn't want to admit, or he has to refuse to admit it in which case it becomes obvious to the audience that he's dodging the question. Mm -hmm. And so that was that was my goal, to either force him to admit things that were uncomfortable for his position on the core issue, or force him to refuse to admit them, in which case it's obvious to the audience that he's just dodging because he doesn't want to answer because it, he knows it'll hurt him. Well, one of, one of my takeaways from what you just talked about, Jimmy, is that these debates take a lot of work and preparation, mm -hmm. especially the cross examination period. You can't just go into that willy nilly. The way you're sketching it out for us is mm -hmm. is very helpful to hear. And that's funny that you said that it would have benefited from more cross examination because that's one thing that James White brought up in his debrief as well mm -hmm. that he had done previous debates where there was more cross examination, which made it even more surprising that he was going to spend multiple questions on fiducia supplicants, mm -hmm. given the fact that it was only one cross-examination period. But that's how things went. And, you know, people have um, different points they want to try to get across. Let, let's get into one more style question before mm -hmm. we jump into the meat of the debates. And that's your use of slides and okay. slideshow. Mm -hmm. Because you, you use slides throughout both debates, uh, even for rebuttals. Mm -hmm. And White commented that this made it seem like you weren't there to genuinely interact with his arguments. So why did you choose to use slides? Yeah, that's... Uh, I understand rhetorically why he went that way, but that's nonsense. Because my slides consisted of two things. They consisted either of points I wanted to make 
and those are principally in in my uh, opening presentation. That's where I really got the points out that I, here are the main things I want to make. And then the other thing they contained is responses to things White had said in previous debates, and he was likely to say in this one. Um, so if you you can even watch, like it, I was I was relooking at I guess it was the justification debate, and in his first rebuttal of me, he he talks. I, I think it's his first. It's either it, in one of his rebuttals to me, he's talking about how Christ's righteousness is imputed to us. Well, I knew he was going to bring that up, so I had a slide prepared. In fact, a pair of slides prepared based on his previous arguments to uh, to talk about in what way is Christ's righteousness imputed to us, and in what way is it not? And so you see him make the criticism, and then you know saying, "Oh, well, he's doing these slides. He's not. It's like he's not really here to engage me." And then he says, "What we really need to talk about is imputation of righteousness." And then in my next statement, here's a slide on imputation of righteousness. So you know, James, I I think to some degree prides himself on kind of being consistent in his arguments across decades. And he doesn't change him that much. So I had a good sense of everything he was going to say. I mean, during the debate on the first night, he kind of noted that I was using slides in rebuttals. And, and I, I joked from the table, I don't think you can really hear it, but I said, I'm psychic. But the real answer is, yeah, you just use the same arguments all the time, so I'm prepared for them. Mm. And I think it's important to note that it it doesn't you weren't necessarily giving a linear presentation like mm -hmm. you were able to jump to a slide correct prepared and on a specific topic for example Second Corinthians five twenty one you had a whole slide I think mm -hmm. devoted to that verse which had come up a few different times in the justification debate yeah he this is something he actually acknowledged the possibility of I, in his I did, I watched his debate debrief once I haven't gone through it thoroughly but um, but he mentioned he didn't know if I had other slides I was not using. Using. The answer is yes. I had other slides I was not using because uh, I needed to prioritize other things based on what he was saying in the debate. So I went to those slides that were either points that I wanted to make or that were directly relevant to things he had been saying in the debate. Or there's kind of a third category too, because if you can, I mean, one of the, a common debating tactic is to preempt to things. This is you could call it a prebuttal where you get an issue on the table before your opponent can mention it in order to frame it in a way that, that is advantageous to your side. And so um, I was either making points I wanted to make, I was responding to points I knew he was going to make or likely to make, or I was pre-buttling things that he might have otherwise said, but I attempted to neutralize by bringing them up because he had said them before. And so, it, you know, I want to, like, for example, um, one thing that I knew I was going to bring up, whether he did or not, was the meaning of anathema, mm -hmm. which I brought up in the second debate. Because it's very clear from watching him, he does not, he has not historically understood what an anathema is. Um, the way he talks about it, he talks about it as if he thinks the Catholic Church is sentencing people to hell with anathemas, and that is not what is going on. An anathema was, because they no longer exist, an anathema was a, an excommunication performed by the local bishop with a special ceremony. It does not apply to all people. It only applies to people under the jurisdiction of the local bishop, and only when he does a judicial proceeding and then does the special ceremony. So, but this is widely misrepresented in the Protestant community, and because of how commonly it's misunderstood, I knew I needed to explain what this term actually means. And then, actually, in the first night, he misused the term anathema. And rather, since I knew I was going to be talking about that in the second night, I, I rather than take time then to discuss it, because you have only a few minutes. Like, our opening statements were 15 minutes. Our first rebuttals were seven minutes. Our second rebuttals were four minutes. You've really got to be concise in what you're going to deal with because you cannot deal with everything. And so rather than take time on that night to explain what anathema is, after James White misused the term, I told the audience, and you're going to want to come back tomorrow night because you're going to want to know what anathema means. And then I left it and moved on. But I definitely was interacting with his case and uh, and in an interactive manner because I was not using all the slides I had.
I think that clears up that slides issue. And mm -hmm. I want to turn to the Sola Scriptura debate more specifically. Let's get into some of the okay. details here. Uh, White argued that Sola Scriptura is the default biblical position. And until someone can prove that there are other inspired or infallible authorities outside of Scripture, Christians should stick with Sola Scriptura. You argued for the apostolic paradigm consisting of Scripture, tradition, and magisterium, <clears throat> which you said Christians should stick to because it has never been abrogated, and it was in place during the time of the apostles. Now, during the rebuttal, after you both made your opening cases, um, you said White was uh, engaged in a tactic known as overloading. Mm -hmm. uh, what does this mean, and how do you think he was doing that? So i got a couple thoughts about this. Um, the first, and, and I'll get to overloading, but I have a couple of preliminary thoughts first. The first one is his claim that sola scriptura is the default position of mm. scripture is ludicrous, because if it's the default position, why is it never used in scripture? What he means, or what he should argue, is that it's a necessary historical inference based on post-biblical premises. Uh, which won't save Sola Scriptura, because if Sola Scriptura is true, then it needs to be proved by Scripture alone, and you can't use post-biblical premises to prove something by Scripture alone. Um, so, uh, so I thought that his, uh, his claim that, that Sola Scriptura is the default position of Scripture is ridiculous when Scripture never even uses it. It's never used during the biblical period. Um, also, um, I, I wanted to make sure, and he also had, he slid between different positions. This is sometimes, this in, it's a form of equivocation that is sometimes in debates called the Mata and Bailey fallacy. It's also known as concept swapping, where what he would do is shift between different concepts without the audience noticing. For example, um, he, in the way the debate resolution, which he picked, is framed, it's that Scripture is the only infallible rule of faith for the church. But then, in the debate itself, he, like, abandons the concept of infallibility and switches. This is the concept swapping. He switches to the concept of inspiration, and he's demanding, well, you must produce you know, in, not just infallible knowledge of things that the apostles passed down. You must prove it, this is inspired. Well, and I actually did that, but he, he, and he rejected it, but I actually did that. When it comes to overloading, this is a, this is a very common strategy. Now, I haven't watched White's debates with non-Catholics, not in any depth. I mean, I saw the one he did with Ehrman when I was researching Ehrman, um, but in his debates with Catholics, he he has a regular tactic of bringing up issues that we're not here to debate, um, and bringing them up just rapid fire. You know, he'll make a whole list of them, and then saying, "And my opponent hasn't done anything to prove these things." Okay, so this is and when when an opponent does that, this is also sometimes called a gish gallop after the young earth creationist Dwayne Gish, who would in his debates just list bunches and bunches and bunches of claims in support of his position and thereby effectively prevent his opponent from having the time to respond to all the issues he's laid on the table. And this is kind of a, frankly, it's a slimy debater tactic, but White uses it all the time. And there are a number of things you can do when, um, when someone is gish galloping on you or o trying to overload you with more topics than you can respond to. Um, because what that is, is it's a rhetorical device designed to keep your opponent from getting to the core of the issue. Mm. Um, and if you name, you know, dozens and dozens or more points than your opponent can respond to, it's effectively, a, it's the human equivalent of a denial of service attack. You know, where on the internet, people will sometimes like bombard an internet website with more requests than it can answer, and it effectively shuts down the site. And that's what you're trying to do with an overload or a gish gallop in a debate. You're trying to prevent your opponent from making his case by making too many demands 
on the situation. And so it does what that does not do is get us to the truth. What's supposed to happen in a debate is you're supposed to get to the truth by arguing the issues we're actually here to discuss. You're not here to try to shut down your opponent by preventing him from uh, from stating his case effectively. Uh, so that's why I say it's a slimy debater tactic. But White does it all the time. Um, some apologists will get distracted by that, and they'll want to answer all the different points that White brings up. And what that does is it causes them to go down rabbit trails trying to respond to things that he said, and that prevents them from making the core case that needs to be made. So they're effectively, you're wasting your time when someone does an overload attack on you if you, if you follow it up. So how can you handle it when someone does that? Well, one option is to do what's known as a uh, weak response reverse gish gallop. And what happens in this is you, at least you can call it that, um, what happens in this is you pick the weakest thing that your opponent charged you with and you go after that and you treat refuting his weakest point as if it refutes everything he said. But that also does not get us to the truth. So that weakest response is not, that weakest point response is also, in my view, unethical mm. because you're 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 not getting us to the truth. You're you're using a rhetorical technique to try to neutralize a bunch of stuff that you really didn't neutralize. So in my view, what an ethical debater needs to do is say, and now I'm not saying you never respond to anything they bring up. I'm just saying you don't respond to the weakest thing they brought up. But when presented with, with a denial of service attack like this, what you need to do is say, is point out what they're doing. And so that's what I did. On the first night, I was more polite about it. Um, when he did it in the Sola Scriptura debate, I said, now my opponent sometimes engages in a debating tactic that's sometimes called um, overloading, where he presents more claims than I have time to respond to. And the only thing for an ethical debater to do, and notice I'm insinuating James White is not being ethical in the debate, um, the only thing for an ethical debater to do is to point it out and stick to the core topic. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, and like, and then in the second night, he did it again. And this time, I, while still trying to be polite, I went a step further and actually used the popular name for this and said, you know, I, Mr. White is trying another overload attack. It's also sometimes called a gish gallop. But the thing to do is stick to the core points. And I then said, and I'm happy to answer any of the particulars that you would like, James, in our cross-examination period. But I'm not going to go. And what that does is it means he then has to waste his cross-examination time on mm -hmm. these subsidiary issues instead of probing me on the core. Um, that's you know, not why I'm doing it. I'm happy to be probed on the core, but I wanted to give him a space where he could ask me about these things if he's really concerned about them. And the cross-examination was the obvious place for that. That is very interesting. I had not heard of that weak response gish gallop idea before, and I, mm -hmm. I now understand why you chose the way to go that you did. Just to see that I'm following the concept, mm -hmm. I imagine the, the charge of overloading was partially due to in the first debate him bringing up in his rebuttal thing that while saying that we'll talk about equivocation a little bit later mm -hmm. but he said you know you, you haven't shown apostolic traditions like the like papal infallibility and the immaculate conception and the bodily assumption of mary and things of this sort and listing them out and then going on to make subsidiary points now one thing you could have done i, I guess if you were following this weak weak gish gallop response is say something like are you kidding you don't think there's any apostolic um, testimony towards or in the ballpark of things like papal infallibility? Have you ever considered, you know, Matthew 16 and this and that and Luke 22 and John 21 and like just pick out very specific things and maybe a few quotes from a church father and just like laser beam focus in on just like one thing and showing how, although he said there's no evidence supporting this, look at all this stuff that I just laid out. But like you said, even if you do that really well, 
it can come across good rhetorically, but look how far we've gone from the core yeah. issues, and we've spent that valuable time elsewhere. Yeah. Just to, and, and this will come up again uh, when we talk about equivocation, but here's a list, because I, 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 I rewatched his rebuttals, which is really where he tended to do this. Um, I, made a, I, I rewatched his rebuttals in the two debates. Here is a list of all the things he wanted me to debate. Okay, this is good. I'm glad you're going to say the list because what I was going to say is some people might say you're using the debate tactic of simply throwing out the charge of overloading and making the person look bad when really they weren't doing that. So it's important that we actually make sure it's a oh, true yeah. case of overload. Yeah. Now, in thinking through this, remember, the like on the first night, we're supposed to be debating authority, you know, scripture alone or scripture, tradition, and magisterium. And those are the principles that we need to be focusing on. On the second night, we're supposed to be debating justification. Okay, so here's the list of topics that he brought up both nights. There were a few on one night that weren't on the other, but the core of the list is the same. Here's the list. The mass is a propitiatory sacrifice. Okay, now you can see that is not a top-level principle like scripture, tradition, or magisterium. It is not part of how we get justified. You know, you can be justified if you've never been to Mass. So this is a subsidiary issue at best. So that's one. The sacramental priesthood. Forgiveness of sins through the sacramental priesthood. The distinction between mortal and venial sins. Indulgences. Imputed righteousness of Christ, Mary, and the saints. Um, the Immaculate Conception. The Perpetual Virginity of Mary. Mary's Assumption, which he said was part of the gospel um, on the Catholic view, which it's not. Uh, Mary's intercession, Mary as the neck that turns the head of grace. Purgatory, specifically an understanding of purgatory that involves punishments and satispatio and the passage of time and also papal infallibility. Okay, that's 16 different things. None of those are at the core of our discussion. Now, you could argue that, well, maybe mortal and venial sins, maybe that would be part of, of the core of the justification debate. Maybe, but that's a case you need to make. You can't just say, oh, and he hasn't proved this. Well, you haven't brought it up and argued why it's relevant. So, um, so this is just, I mean, 16 different topics, all of which are not at the core of what we're here to do. At best, they're tertiary things like you know mary's immaculate conception follows if you accept the apostolic paradigm but what we're here to debate is not mary's assumption if you wanted to debate that that would require its own debate um we're here to debate is is sola scriptura or the apostolic paradigm true and so this is a this is a gish gallop. This is a distraction from the core issues by bringing up a bunch of, at best, subsidiary issues and demanding that I waste time in responding to them. Well, I'm not going to bite on that. I'll, instead, the ethical thing to do is point out what he's doing and stick to the core issues, which is what I did. So getting back to that first debate, there were mm -hmm. arguments that you didn't use uh, mm -hmm. in that debate that... Um, sometimes are commonly brought up, such as the charge that Sola Scriptura is a blueprint for disagreement and anarchy mm -hmm. among Christians. Uh, why didn't you use some common arguments against Sola Scriptura that other apologists use? Well, in some cases, I think that um, I, there's a range of reasons, but they all have in common that I don't think they're the strongest arguments. Um, some of them, I think, are just mistaken. You know, I, I encounter arguments because people on different sides, they come up with a lot of arguments. Some of them I don't think work. Others are highly debatable. Like, for example, and I'll, I'll get to the Blueprint for Anarchy one, but um, sometimes maybe there's something there, but it's, it's highly debatable. Like claiming the Moses seat argument from Matthew mm -hmm. 23, you know, do whatever they tell you because they sit in Moses seat. Well, the, the problem is we don't, have a good understanding of what that means. 
Um, there are some proposals about what that means, and I know what one James is going to do. James is going to say, oh, all Moses' seat is is a physical seat in a synagogue that they read the law from. Well, that was true in later centuries, but if you actually look into the scholarship on this, we're not sure how the phrase, we're not sure that any of those physical seats existed in the first century. Um, they definitely existed later, but we don't have evidence for them existing at the time of Christ. And we don't have a clear understanding of exactly what are the parameters of what Moses' seed involved. So this is an ambiguous one. And anything that's ambiguous is not strong. So that's like why I didn't do that. And then there's the blueprint for anarchy argument. Well, I think there's a kernel of truth in this one. Um having a living magisterium that can rule on questions does give you an advantage over not having one but um but it's not a strong it's not the strongest argument it's not the core the core of why sola scriptura is false is it does not meet its own test okay if it doesn't meet its own test it's game over for sola scriptura. And whether it leads to anarchy or not is a separate thing. And there's ambiguity in that, because, you know, uh, while I think there is greater doctrinal diversity in Protestantism than in Catholicism or other historic branches of Christianity, um, most of the audience isn't going to be familiar with that. Most people know what their own church teaches and maybe a little bit about some other churches, but they're not going to have a sense of just how much doctrinal diversity there is in Protestantism compared to historic branches. And James is going to be right there saying, oh, but you've got liberal Catholics who disagree with, yeah, and they're disagreeing with the teaching of the church. That's the point. You know, uh, if you have a teaching office that can give you things, that's a benefit as opposed to having no teaching office at all. Whether people agree with the teaching office is a separate issue. But you see how already, just in this short space, playing both parts, I've been able to to fuzz this issue to where mm -hmm. it's not nearly as convincing. So given that I only have 15 minutes for an opening statement, seven minutes for first rebuttal, and four minutes for second rebuttal, I've got to prioritize what I do. And I'm going to stick with the strongest things. I'm not going to go, even though I think there's some value to this argument, I think it's, a, I think it's, it's, it's not a top-level argument. And so I would just leave arguments that are mistaken, ambiguous, or weaker to one side and stick with the strong stuff. I like what you did there, too, of kind of like playing out how it would go. Because when we're planning or thinking about what kind of arguments we want to run, it's important to anticipate the responses or the likely responses just so that we can see, okay, so how much are my counters going to get into the weeds or possibly blur the issues or am I going to lose people or am I going to need an extra five minutes here versus mm -hmm. just two minutes and those are all important things to to, to have a successful debate mm -hmm. uh, but I want to get to the back to this case and the heart of your case because when you were arguing for the apostolic paradigm and he was arguing for sola scriptura he said your case for apostolic tradition was based on equivocation mm -hmm. and what, what I what it's what I gathered that he was saying is this is really for two reasons first he said it's equivocation because apostolic tradition as it's used in scripture is synonymous with the gospel mm -hmm. and not things alongside of scripture and then he also seemed to insinuate that it was equivocation because the examples that you gave and feel free to talk about those you know three or four examples that you gave were different in kind he he made it sound like from things like the marian dogmas or papal infallibility which we also hold to based on apostolic tradition. So for those two reasons that apostolic tradition is synonymous in scripture with simply the gospel, and two, the examples you gave of supposed apostolic traditions, according to him, weren't really the, 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 the good juicy ones like the Marian dogmas or papal infallibility. So what did that, given all that, what'd you think about the charge of equivocation? I thought it was lame. Now, from a, from a rhetorical standpoint, there is a benefit if you can put a name on what your opponent is doing. And so he tried to name what I was doing as equivocation. Equivocation is what occurs when you shift meanings. I was not shifting meanings. I was not equivocating. Just factually, I wasn't equivocating. I was using my terms consistently. Um, what he was, what he should have done if he wanted to pursue this line of argument was accuse me of using mistaken definitions. 
but equivocation happens when you shift back and forth between them. And I was not doing that. Um, I was using the term apostolic tradition to refer to anything that is binding on Christians that is passed down alongside Scripture from the apostles. Um, and I used that definition consistently through the debates. Now, what he, what he wanted to do was identify apostolic tradition with the gospel. And here, actually, he, he, either, he either was equivocating on what the meaning of gospel is, or he just doesn't understand what the meaning of gospel is. And I don't know which of those is the case. But um, if you, and this is not a point of dispute between Catholics and Protestants, <clears throat> if you read people who, uh, who study Greek and who study the text of the New Testament, they will tell you that the word euangelion, or gospel, is not a synonym for the entirety of Christian doctrine. You know, the, the Christian doctrine teaches, for example, that angels exist, but the existence of angels is not part of the gospel. If you really look at what Scripture says, um, the gospel is that God has intervened in the affairs of mankind by sending his son to establish his reign and to make it possible for us to be in union with him. And he has this new age of righteousness that's coming. That's the gospel. Um, unfortunately, James has, at least at various places, he would say things like, the Catholic Church teaches that the assumption of Mary is part of the gospel. Where does the Catholic Church do that? It never says that. No, I, I don't know any Catholic scholar who believes that, because the existence, in fact, the, the, if you read the Second Vatican Council, it talks about there being a hierarchy of truths where even though they're all true, some truths are central mm. to the Christian faith, and that's where the gospel is going to be. And it expressly acknowledges Marian doctrines are not the core teachings. Well, he so, also used these other phrases, like mm. these are day feeding <clears throat> dogmatic teachings of the Church, and I think his emphasis was on, because on the Catholic view, you are you are required to believe these things, that's what makes them part of the gospel. Yeah, that's and ridiculous. So, uh, yeah. The Bible requires me to believe that angels exist— but that doesn't mean that angels, the existence of angels, is part of the gospel. The Bible also requires me to believe that Andrew was the brother of Peter, but that doesn't mean the, the brothership of Andrew and Peter is part of the gospel. And in the same way, yeah, okay, so it's been revealed, and the Catholic Church is infallibly defined that Mary was assumed into heaven, and I need to believe that the same way I need to believe that angels exist, and the same way I need to believe that Andrew was the brother of Peter, but that doesn't make any of these things part of the gospel. So he either is himself shifting around what gospel means, because he seems to, on other occasions, have a better awareness of what the gospel is, or he just doesn't understand what the term gospel means. So what do you think about the point that in every case where apostolic tradition is pointed to positively in Scripture, it only refers to the gospel. That was yeah. a point he made, and, and I think in, in that sense he's using gospel as <clears throat> the good news yeah. of what God has accomplished in Jesus Christ. Yeah, this is factually false. Um, the, for example, and I'll give I'll give you two examples, uh, both of them from Second Thessalonians. One of them I used in the debate, and the other I didn't. So one of the things that I did point out in the debate is that when Paul is discussing with the Thessalonians in his second letter who is restraining the or what is who or what is restraining the appearance of the man of lawlessness he says you already know this cuz remember I told you so okay that therefore was an element of apostolic tradition that he had communicated to them previously but it's not found in scripture because he doesn't go on to say what it is he just says remember I told you about this you, he says, you already know this, and then he doesn't answer the question of what is it, because they already know it. So this is clearly an apostolic tradition, but the identity of whatever is restraining the man of lawlessness is not part of the gospel, if you have a correct understanding of what the gospel is. Now, if, if James wants to use the term gospel contra the way it's used in the Bible to refer to the entirety of Christian teaching— well, then he'd be right that the gospel is synonymous with apostolic tradition, but that doesn't tell us what the content of Christian teaching is. So you could say, well, the Assumption of Mary is part of the gospel then on that definition, and so it is part of apostolic tradition. You can see how 
he seems to slide back and forth between what does the gospel mean, because he says it's identical with the gospel, A, without proving that, but B, expecting you to be able to identify what it is, as if it's some subset of broader claims made in Christianity. Um, but it's just false, because on nobody's account would the restrainer of the man of lawlessness be something that's part of the gospel. Another thing that is also from that I didn't bring up, but is also from Second Corinthians. This is from Second Corinthians three. Um, Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians. Sorry, Second Thessalonians. Um, is uh, is when he is talking to them again about idleness, because he brought this up in First Corinthians, and he said nobody should be living in idleness and sponging off others. And then he get he he's had some further correspondence with him. He's heard this is still happening. <clears throat> and so he ratchets it up, and he says, this time, stay away from any brother who is living in idleness and not in accordance with the tradition that we gave to you. So he had given them a tradition that people should work for a living. So that's an ethical tradition. And since it's from Paul an Apostle, it's an apostolic tradition. And it's binding because he says, stay away from anyone who's not doing this. So here we have a binding apostolic tradition, but the idea that people need to work for a living instead of just not working for a living, that's not part of the gospel. And so I think the not only is James's claim problematic, because he does nothing to argue for it, uh, that the apostolic tradition and the gospel are synonymous, he gives us no reason to believe that which means he hasn't proven his case, and he's got the affirmative in this debate. He can't, you can't just assume things that you want to be true. You have to give evidence for him, and he didn't do that. But it's also obviously false, because there are things that I can and did in the debate document um, that are part of apostolic tradition that are not part of the gospel. Or, yeah, we, or if you redefine gospel to mean all Christian teaching, then you don't know what it includes, and you thus have to be open to other things like the Assumption of Mary being part of Christian teaching. That's a key part, too, about the openness. Can we look at those examples just briefly that you had brought up in the debate of things that were apostolic traditions that we agree oh, on? Sure. And I'm curious of, of why you chose um, those those examples. And what I detected was he had a couple of replies, and then we're going to get to the second debate shortly, mm -hmm. but he had a couple of replies to those examples. He didn't talk a lot about them, no. but when he did, he kind of gave what, what, the, what I could sense was almost like a, a two-pronged approach. One was kind of dismissing them as not being, you know, high level enough, like papal infallibility and Marian dogmas and so forth. And then the other was to point to that they actually do have a foundation in Scripture, such as when he went to Hebrews 1. So I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit about that. Why did you choose those examples of apostolic traditions, and what did you think about his response? Okay, so what I, I should first mention what they were, because— Oh, yeah, let's the, list them out. One, yeah. one of the things that White has done in previous debates is say, and no one can even show us what any apostolic traditions are. Prove to me that, you know, something is an apostolic tradition. So— it's like, okay, well, I'll do that. You know, this is me interacting with him and having a slide ready for it. Um, so I had a slide prepared where I said, here are four apostolic traditions, and, and I picked these four because we agree on them. Both the congregation in this Baptist church and the Catholic church, we're going to agree on these four. I could have picked others. Like, for example, we have first century evidence that baptism can validly be administered uh, by infusion, uh, by pouring, um, because the Didache, which is a first century Christian document, says it can be. But this is a Baptist church that I'm in, and so they're not going to they're not going to like that. Now, I, I, so I didn't bring that up. I could have brought it up if I wanted to show them that tradition, that good, solid, reliable traditions contradict their understanding of of baptism. But that's not what I'm here to debate. So I picked four things that we both agree on. One, there are no new apostles. And I to explain that, I said, you know, Paul was not an eyewitness of Christ, but Christ appeared to him and commissioned him as an apostle. He, there's, he could have kept doing that. That's essentially the claim of the Mormon church, that God continues to appoint apostles today. Um, but we as Christians agree that that is not what God chose to do. But it never says in Scripture that God is going to stop appointing new apostles. Second, 
We also agree that there is to be no new public revelation, meaning revelation that is binding on the entire Christian public. Mormon Church also disagrees with that. Third, there is, because public revelation ended, there is to be no new scripture. Okay, Mormon Church disagrees with that. They have new scriptures like Doctrine and Covenants. And fourth, consequently, the New Testament consists of only 27 books, and we agree on that. So we ha And none of these things are taught in Scripture. There is no place where it says the apostles are going to stop. There is no place where it says God's not going to continue giving public revelation. There is no place where it says that, um, that there is not going to be any new Scripture after the death of the last apostle, and there is no place that it says the New Testament is these 27 books. But we agree on these, and they're binding belief for Christians. And since they're not found in apostolic tradition, they would therefore, since they're not found in Scripture, they would therefore be classified as apostolic tradition. And he largely ignored that and blew past it and denied it without really engaging it. Um, so I wasn't particularly impressed with his response. Um, at one point, he did try to critique one part of it, the idea there are going to be no new apostles. Um, in, 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 uh, in the cross-examination period, I was, I was, I wasn't asking him about this, but I happened to mention that I had, I had, de I had demonstrated, you know, this apostolic tradition. And he said, well, no, Hebrews 1 implies that. And I summarized Hebrews 1, I said, well, it's, Hebrews 1 says that God appeared to our fathers in, or spoke to our fathers in many different ways in the past, but now he's spoken to us by his son. It doesn't say anything about there not being any further apostles. White asserted, without arguing it, that it did, and I said, well, I would invite the audience to read First Corinthians, uh, to read Hebrews 1 and see if it even mentions apostles. It doesn't. And James said, I never said it did. And I said, well, then I think that weakens your case, um, because you're going way beyond the text here. It just never says there aren't going to be any new apostles. God could have Set, given us the core of the Christian faith through his son, and then continued to appoint new apostles to preach that faith and maybe even receive revelation on other topics besides the core of the Christian faith. In fact, we know that the coming of Christ didn't prevent there from being new apostles because otherwise we wouldn't have Paul, because Paul was appointed after Christ had already s spoken to mankind. Mm. And so obviously... The, the definitiveness of Christ's revelation doesn't mean there's no new apostles or no new revelation or no new scriptures because you'd have to, you'd have to lose Paul, you'd have to lose the book of Revelation, you'd have to lose everything that Paul wrote, and, uh, and I don't think most Protestants are going to want to lose those things. That's an important point, too, about the Hebrews 1 argument because... On his paradigm, it's not enough that it be a plausible interpretation that it lead to, let's say, no more apostles, but it really yeah. needs to follow by good and necessary consequence. Th and so is, I think yeah. you were this able to point out that it doesn't follow by that strong of a, that airtight of an argument. Maybe it's an indication of a possibility mm -hmm. or a plausibility, but that's you need more than that. Yeah, this is something that could have come up in the debate. Uh, it, it didn't. Um, but I was quite prepared to, to, to point out, you know, the, uh, the, the understanding of Sola Scriptura that James White adheres to as illustrated by the quotation I gave from the Roman Catholic controversy is that doctrines must either be found explicitly in Scripture or by necessary inference. They must be found there. So not just do, can you infer it from Scripture. You've got to prove it. This is necessarily inferred from Scripture. Mm -hmm. And he never meets that test, especially not, especially not here, for example. What else did you try to bring out in that cross-examination? Because like I said before, people commented they thought your cross-examination was was pretty strong. Mm -hmm. um, there was It was an interesting cross-ex period. One time he even accused you of asking a false question, and you said, well, actually, I think it's a true question. But what were some of, some of your other goals in that Sola Scriptura debate for the cross-ex? Well, the goals were to ask him uncomfortable questions to reveal weaknesses in his position. And so um, among the things I explored with him— and he, I have to say, um, it was an interesting experience because when you're debating, you have to figure out 
on the fly how you're going to respond to someone because he would try to monopolize this period. This is really my time. I get to ask and explore his thought here. Um, but that doesn't give him the ability to filibuster and chew up time, which he would try to do a little bit. He also repeatedly would interrupt me as I was in the process of either responding to his question or asking a new question. He'd pipe up and start talking over me. And I chose not to come down on that. Instead, I would just continue talking and reassert my question because if I if I'd said James shut up it would have come across uh, you know stop stop interrupting me while I'm asking you a question it would have come across as rude mm -hmm. and so you have to unfortunately that's one of the realities of this these situations if you, you have to figure out in the moment what's what's the best approach in terms of delivery and um but if you watch that you know you might find it interesting to just count the number of times he interrupts me um having said that uh i wanted to drive him to the issue of can you show me and this is the question that he said was false um among the things I wanted to drive him to was a, a question of, well, if apostolic tradition, if you say it's that there is no apostolic tradition today that is binding on Christians that is not written in Scripture, which is his position, then either you'd have to show that from Scripture alone that all apostolic tradition was going to get written down by the death of the last apostle, so it became Scripture, or you'll have to show that any remaining apostolic traditions that did not get written down will lose their authority in the post-apostolic age, despite the fact they were considered binding apostolic tradition during the apostolic age. And if you're going to prove sola scriptura from Scripture alone, you've got to prove one of those two things. And you can't do either, because there are, all, there are very few passages in the New Testament that even envision a post-apostolic age, and none of those passages say anything like all the tradition's going to get written down or it's going to lose its authority. None of them say anything like that. In fact, as I pointed out in the debate, Second Timothy, you've got Timothy, as, uh, Paul, as he's about to die, telling Timothy to pass on apostolic tradition in the post-apostolic age, and he names the first four generations for passing it down, his own apostolic generation, Timothy's generation, the generation Timothy teaches, and the generation they teach. So the New Testament envisions apostolic um, tradition being passed down after the apostles in one of the few passages that even envisions a post-apostolic age. Um, but as this is one of those places where White would not bite, you know, because he could see where I'm going. And he, he, and when I said, okay, you, you need to show me one of these two things, he said, that's a false question. And then he kind of rambled a little bit, and my initial response was, it's a true question. Um, now, I did see a, uh, a Protestant commentator who I thought was quite good um, reviewing this debate who suggested maybe what White meant was a false dichotomy rather than a false question. But I'm not sure what that false dichotomy would be, because it seems to me obvious, you know, these are the two options. Either they all get written down, or they lose their authority on this view. It's got to, it, it, one or the other. I'm not seeing what other good options there are here to make this a false dichotomy. But I, I you know what, actually, I, I think I, I, I think I could see a third. I uh, think I, where I think he might split it and say false dichotomy is that. You're, you're right with those two options, but the third option would be they don't get written down and we have no epistemic access to them. Something of that sort. I, I would incorporate that under they lose their authority. Oh, because, I see. Okay. Yeah, because if we don't know, even if we have them, but we don't know what they are, they're mm -hmm. not authoritative anymore. Got it. Oh, then, then I think it is a true dichotomy if you carve it up that way. Yeah. Okay. In any event, he didn't explain either why it was a false dichotomy or a false question. Okay, I that was really good on the on the first debate. I wanted to have. A, is there anything else on the first debate, Jimmy, that you were itching to to, to bring up? Because there, there was a lot of good stuff. I want to get to the second debate for a bit. Nothing coming to my mind. Okay, the second debate was on how Christians are to have peace with God, and 
what was interesting, we kind of talked about this earlier when you said how the debate came up, because it was pitched to the audience that night as I looked at the video as a question, you know, how are we to have peace with God? Mm -hmm. But then you had that specific resolution that Christians have peace with God through these four conditions. Yeah, I found and, it interesting that yeah. James was the one who came up with that resolution, and he didn't even talk about it in mm. his own remarks. Mm. He just ditched his own resolution. Yeah, that should have been more clear to the audience as well, because they almost posed it as if it was just a question, how are you to have peace with God, and then each side is going to present it. Um, so anyway, I, th that was that was a little confusing to mm. someone who's watching it for the first time, but your approach in the debate was very unique. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, White described it as very different from previous debates he had done on the subject, um, which he kept bringing up multiple times. So what was your approach, and why did you approach the debate that way? Well, um, so I think a lot of Catholic apologists make mistakes for historical reasons of trying to maximize disagreement with Protestants when it comes to salvation. You often hear uh, it said by by Protestants and by some Catholics, that, well, Catholics, Protestants believe in salvation by faith alone or justification by faith alone, and self, Catholics believe in salvation by faith and works. Okay, you know how many times the Church says that in its official teaching documents? None. It never says that. This is a popular summary that is, f frankly, mistaken. The Catholic Church does not articulate its understanding of salvation or justification this way. And... Um, and so I, th but nevertheless, I think out of a kind of tribalism, people on both sides, both Protestants and Catholics, want to maximize the differences between their tribe and the neighboring tribe, and they want to uh, show that their tribe is right. And so uh, a lot of apologists are combative. You know, it, it's 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 a it's kind of an occupational hazard. And so a lot of previous apologists have, uh, have taken a combative approach on this. But that's not the Church's approach. In fact, the Church's approach for decades has been to look for common ground on this. And, to, and even just reading Trent, you know, the Council of Trent, it does not say what people today are representing it as saying. And it never has. And Catholic scholars have always known that. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't know how to read church documents. They're not, that's just not their area of expertise. And they don't give it the kind of careful, cautious reading that such documents demand. And so you have a lot of apologists, both Protestant and Catholic, misreading what Trent said and thinking it was saying things it was not. So my goal, if I'm in a justification discussion, is to clear the air and say, no, 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 don't buy into all these old stereotypes. Here's what's really going on. And this is not anything new. This is something Catholic scholars have always been aware of. And I could have quoted Catholic scholars from previous decades pointing this out um, if I had had time. But again, 15 minutes, seven minutes, four minutes. I really have to prioritize. So if I'm going to communicate what the Church actually teaches, in this area and what it doesn't teach about the Protestant ideas, I don't have time to be pulling in lots of other Catholic sources to document it. I've really got to stick with just the key ones. And so um, so basically, I, sa I, went, I said, okay, let's talk about the, the resolution that James proposed. Um, it says we get peace, so here's what peace is. We agree about that. It says we get it through the finished work of Jesus Christ. Does the Catholic Church acknowledge that Jesus has a finished work? Well, yeah, he do it does. You go through the catechism, there are bunches of places where it talks about Christ's finished work on the cross, which is, of course, distinct from his intercessory ministry that he has now. That's not finished. He still lives to intercede for us, as Scripture says. Um, but his work on the cross, that's finished. So we agree on that. Uh, do we get peace and justification by grace? Yeah, we do. In fact, the Church acknowledges that. Do we get it by faith alone? Well, here's... Oh, do we get it by imputation of Christ's righteousness? The Church acknowledges that, yeah, we are imputed righteous because of Christ. It doesn't mean we have identical righteousness to Christ's righteousness, but it does acknowledge this. Um, and then lastly, is it faith alone? Well, the, Cal the Catholic Church doesn't have a problem with the formula faith alone. This I know this is a big surprise to some people, but 
it w- it's been used in Catholic tradition historically. St. Augustine used it. Thomas Aquinas used it repeatedly. These guys are doctors of the church. And Trent did not condemn it. What Trent condemned was one understanding of the formula faith alone, where it was understood to mean justification by intellectual assent alone, without trust or love. And and that's not what Protestants are teaching. So Trent only condemned this one understanding of faith alone, and the Church in 1999 signed a joint declaration and its annex with the Lutheran World Federation in which the Church acknowledged it. We can say we're, we're justified by faith alone. Now, that's not the language of the Bible. It's not the most common language, but if it's understood correctly, if it's understood in terms of faith that works through love, or what Catholic theologians have historically called formed faith, then we don't disagree. And in fact, I then quoted Pope Benedict XVI, saying that Luther's formula of faith alone is true as long as you understand it in terms of faith that's working through love. And um, and so, since I've covered you know the reasons why James White wants to say we've got a false gospel, at least the core reasons, I therefore said, well, okay, if if we can agree to this understood correctly, then it doesn't look like the Catholic Church is teaching a false gospel, and that's the main point I wanted to bring home to the audience. So rather than taking a combative approach on this issue, I took a conciliatory approach on the issue, and that really surprised James. Now, in terms of his prior debates with Catholics, I mean, he mentioned, he oh boy, does he mention these. Um, I mean, he, he would bring them up multiple times each night. I'm I'm not really sure why I I felt like saying so James who do you think you're debating tonight, but I realize he's not advancing his case by doing this. So if he wants to waste his time, who am I to object? Um, although I did note I was watching a, a bit of a debate between him and Leland Flowers, where Leland Flowers refers to a prior exchange involving someone else, and James White says he's not here tonight. Debate me. And so I thought that was kind of ironic, given how often he does this exact thing. But he would name people like Jerry Mattatix and Robert Sungenis, neither of whom I think have a full grasp of what the Church teaches on this subject. He also would name Father Mitch Pacwa, who I, I have a lot of respect for. But his debate with Mitch Pacwa was in the 1990s. And that was before the Joint Declaration on Justification was signed. So, of course, he's not going to be citing that. And, of course, he's not going to be quoting Benedict the Sixteenth because he wasn't Pope yet. So, you know, I don't know, I don't know what approach Father Pacwa would take today, but he tends to think with the Church, so I would assume he would tend to do something along the lines that I just did. Another issue he took with with your opening, Jimmy, in that second debate mm-hmm. is that you had said you weren't there to dispute about words. Oh, this but then was awesome! Yeah, you you went on to talk about, and actually, just right now, as you were kind of summarizing some of those key ideas, you were talking about the different kinds of faith, the kind mm-hmm. of faith alone that the Council of Trent did condemn versus didn't condemn. And he said, "Well, hey, you said you're not here to dispute about words, but here you are parsing things and making yeah. all these distinctions and analyzing words very specifically." So. Aren't you just being inconsistent? Yeah, I and I've seen other people who picked this up from him and have been saying the same thing online. Um, this is one of those areas where I'm a little mystified um, because, and and I don't know. I, I I see people who propose things like White is just being insincere and he's being deceptive a good bit of the time, and I don't want to attribute bad faith to him. But unless he was being deliberately deceptive in saying this, he must have just had a brain freeze. Because what he said does not follow at all. I said, I'm not here to quarrel about words. That's different than talking about words. You can talk about words all day long without quarreling about them. In fact, if you want to avoid quarrels, what you frequently need to do is talk about words and say, here are the different ways this word is used, and as long as we understand it this way, we're in fundamental agreement. We don't have to quarrel about the phrasing. Mm 
That's what I was doing. I was talking about words to defuse quarrels. If I had been quarreling about them, I would have said things like, this is the only acceptable use of the, of the word faith, and if you use it differently, then you're a heretic. And I wasn't doing that. I was doing the opposite of that. So his, 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 it was kind of a, a glib squib for him to say, oh, well, he said he's not here to quarrel about words, and then he talks about them. Well, yeah, talking is not quarreling, dude. But uh, so I, I, it's such a, such a non sequitur that I can only assume he had a brain freeze. I, I thought the way you just explained it there, sometimes people call this, you were trying to avoid merely verbal disputes yeah. and instead have a substantive disagreement and the yeah. substance behind words, which is important to um, that you get to that. And I, I'll just say, I definitely, I don't think he's insincere at all. I think he's mm -hmm. very sincere, but he might've been frustrated or flustered with mm -hmm. the case that you gave because mm -hmm. it was probably not what he was expecting given um, the way you approached it very uniquely and in that conciliatory way. So who knows, maybe that's what led to some of those comments. Um, I did, I did want to ask about yeah. a central issue though, mm -hmm. which in that second debate, which was so regarding peace with God, it, it concerned the interpretation of Romans four verse eight or Romans mm -hmm. four in general, which he had exegeted in his opening statement. And in that passage, and this came up in the cross examination <clears throat> as well. In that passage, it said that quote, Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not impute his sin, or impute sin, end quote. And White argues that in Catholic theology, there can be no blessed men because of the prospect of the possibility of future venial or future mortal sins, which would indeed be imputed to the sinner. And he even did a whole line of cross-examination questions that led to this <clears throat> conclusion as well. So given all that, how do you interpret this passage from St. Paul's letter to the Romans? Well, of course, I, I I believe I'm interpreting it the same way St. Paul did, which is uh, you're blessed if you're in a state of forgiveness. If you've committed a sin and you've repented and God has forgiven you, you're blessed. What James is trying to do is, um, and this came up in a couple of different ways in the cross-examination, but what he's trying to do is force into this passage the idea that you've been forgiven at a single moment in your life for all of your sins, past, present, and future. And he's trying to portray that man as blessed, as you're not blessed if you haven't been forgiven of your future sins as well as your past ones. Okay, is that remotely what David, who wrote this psalm, would have been thinking? Did ancient Hebrews have the idea that, oh, I just need to turn to God and repent, and then I'm forgiven for all of my sins, past, present, and future? Or did they have the idea, I've, I need, when, when I sin, I incur new guilt, and I need to take steps to deal with that, including repenting and going to the temple and offering a new sacrifice, because I'm not forgiven for my future sins. So when I commit new sins, I need new forgiveness. Well, obviously, the ancient Hebrews believed the latter, because they didn't have the idea of, even if you buy the idea, which I think is flatly unbiblical, but even if you buy the idea that Christians have some kind of forgiveness for future sins because of Christ's perfect sacrifice on the cross, they didn't know about that in David's time, a thousand years before Christ. In fact, mm. the prophecies of the Messiah as the successor of David hadn't even been given yet. We're still in the time of the first David. So um, so it, the idea that David would have thought, oh, I'm blessed because I've been forgiven all of my future sins is just ridiculous. And it's therefore going beyond the meaning of the psalm that is being cited to try to force this futuristic forgiveness into the text because it would not have been there and it's not in the psalm and so it's not in romans unless romans add something to it to say and you're forgiven of your future sins mm. which romans and every other book of the new testament never says and now as i uh, well go ahead i was going to add one more point though because I, I take mm -hmm. him to be arguing that it's the tense of the verb in that verse that implies it when it says, blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not impute sin, that that therefore entails that the Lord will never impute any of your sins in the future because it uses, 
that phrase rather than, I guess, just saying against whom the Lord does not impute sin. Um, and I think he puts a lot of weight on on the tense or the description. He used some phrase to describe the Greek there. But, well, it's, uh, an a, it's an aorist verb, and aorist verbs normally pertain to the past. Um, and they, you can't, the whole, and aorist verbs are notoriously difficult to read um, fine shades of aspect out of because that's the whole that's the meaning of the term aorist it means undefined and so aorist verbs have an undefined aspect meaning that you can't say even whether it's talking about an ongoing action or a completed action mm. um and it's definitely the the verb the verb here it for that in some translations is rendered will never count or will never reckon is logisethai which is which is uh it's aorist mm. um and so it's not a, even a future tense verb even if it was that wouldn't i've already shown that it can't mean that uh david believed he was forgiven of all future sins because that's not how the hebrew mind worked regarding mm. regarding sins in this age you commit a new sin you need to go to the temple and offer a new sin sacrifice yeah and as i was reflecting on this jimmy too i kind of put a little more emphasis on the object of well what sin is being talked about there against the man whom the lord will not impute sin even if it did let's say imply some um you know futureness to the tense there what it could be getting at is the notion that the lord will never count that sin against you what mm -hmm. sin the sin that you confessed the sin that david um you know confessed to committing and that the lord forgive and i kind of just as a quick little analogy was thinking about this in spousal relationships or things that people can probably relate to with significant others you know when you do something wrong and you know you've you know harmed someone or done something bad and you eventually fess up to it and ask the person to forgive you and they forgive you, there's still a little worry in the back of your mind that like, hey, at a later date, you know, if you're in an argument, that person can bring up like, well, remember when you did this bad thing and you did this other thing and you did this, that, and 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 it's kind of, it can be nerve wracking, but part of a loving relationship is you agree not to do that when you give that genuine, authentic forgiveness. And I kind of almost see that as a slightly analogous to what God is saying here to David is, you know, you've confessed that sin, we've dealt with it and you are forgiven, that sin will never be counted against you. Mm -hmm. But doesn't it doesn't entail that if you commit some future sin that you don't also have to um, confess that. Yeah. So I just want to... Uh, go ahead, follow up. Yeah. Go ahead. One, one thing I wanted to mention is, so I don't know off the top of my head exactly how James takes this, and so I don't know if he's... I, I, I don't want to... I don't want to commit to any position regarding how he takes the Greek, um, but in it, it occurred to me that part of what may convey the impression here, and maybe this is what you were thinking of, is in a lot of translations, it's like, blessed is the man or the person against whom the Lord will never count sin. Right. And that, and so that could convey the idea of futurity, because in English, so really technically in a linguistic sense, English only has two tenses, present and past, um, meaning tenses where we change the form of the verb to indicate you know, what time we're talking about. The way we get to doing future tenses is we bring in an extra verb. We bring in or an, a helper word. We bring in the auxiliary verb will. And so um, instead of saying, um, I drive, that's present tense, we stick in a will if uh, it's for I will drive, and that makes it conveys the future aspect here, the future time here. Um, but that's not the only function of will. And what's really generating the will here in Greek is not the future tense, it's the fact that this aorist verb is in the subjunctive mood. And in the subjunctive mood, um, it, so, so the subjunctive mood is conditional. It's different than the indicative. When, you, when you're speaking in the indicative, you're just saying this is the fact. When you're talking in the, condition, in the subjunctive, you're talking about something that could be or would be or might be. And we tend to add helper words like could, would, or might when we're using a subjunctive 
mood in English. Um, but another way of doing that, of introducing that little conditionality, is by throwing in a will. And so that's really what the will is doing here. It's not serving as a marker of the future. It's serving as a marker of the subjunctive, that, it, that God, it, you're blessed if God won't do this. Um, and you could also translate this, um, blessed is the man against whom God does not impute sin, but uh, so there are a variety of ways to do this, and for one reason or another, some translations have thrown in the word will, which can sound like it's indicating futurity when really it's just indicating su subjectivity. Well, that's a very helpful point, bring out some of those finer issues. Actually, one other moment in the debate, too, I'll mm -hmm. just bring this up where he brought up the Greek, was with 2 Corinthians 5.21 during mm -hmm. cross-examination. And I actually, I liked your response here, because I was kind of scared. I mean, I don't, I don't know the Greek. I have to rely on uh, folks like you and, and people to explain it in more detail. But he, he was started asking you a question about 2 Corinthians 5.21, and he said, you know, you said we can't read too much out of this because it's poetic. And then he said, like, and what do you do with Huper Hemon? And I was like, oh, gosh, what is Huper Hemon? <laughs> and, uh, and, and sometimes in those moments, it could be like, ah, actually, okay, sorry. I'll make one other tangent, Jimmy, if you can mm -hmm. permit it. There was a famous time, I think it was the 2016 presidential run or something, but Gary Johnson was a libertarian candidate, mm -hmm. and he was like in a famous interview, and it became like this whole thing because one of the uh, people who was interviewing him about policy was talking about like economics and then something, and then all of a sudden out of the blue, they just asked him, so what do you think about Aleppo? And Gary Johnson had this famous response, what is Aleppo? And then it, mm -hmm. and, he, and, the, and the reporter was like, oh, you're kidding. You don't know what Aleppo is, and out of context, out of nowhere, mm -hmm. it could be very scary if you've if you've not like thought about <clears> it. It turns out Aleppo is a city in Syria, and they were talking about foreign policy it's and wars the, in Syria. It's, it's also the site of historic site of one of the most famous Jewish codices of the Old Testament, the Aleppo Codex. Oh wow! See, I didn't even know that. It's incredible. But in that context, the reporter was able to make Gary Johnson look very bad. Because he kind of brought this like Aleppo word out of nowhere. He like he didn't say, So what do you think about the war going on in Syria? Mm -hmm. He just kind of gave this more esoteric Aleppo to uh, kind of set him up and it and it made him look real bad. It was really damaging to his campaign. And I always get worried that in debates like this, that can happen when you throw out like a Greek term, like so like he was talking about poetic and then so what do you do with Huper Hemon? And I was like, Oh my gosh, mm -hmm. what is this Huper Hemon? But I liked how you responded in that you said, Well, here, let me pull it up. Yeah, that's always a nice thing because you want to look at it. I want to look at if I'm going to comment on the Greek, I want to see the Greek in context and have it in front of me and not just go by memory. Yes. Um, so yeah, it's it. So huper is a preposition in Greek. Well, hemon means us, and it's a plural pronoun, and um, and plural first person pronoun, and huper means things like for on behalf of, um, in our stead, you know, things like that. And so what Christ is, what Paul is saying here is that uh, God made the one who did not know sin, meaning Christ, to be sin, and then in some translations it will say, <clears throat> on our behalf, um, which, and that's huper hemon in Greek. Right. But I and he's saying, and he was arguing that that verse was evidence of the imputation of Christ's yeah, righteousness, but, or our sin to Christ, and then his righteousness to us. Well, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, but the thing is, language contains so much flexibility, and this is a problem that I see regularly, not just with James White, but with a lot of Calvinists, and frankly, a lot of apologists, who just don't recognize, and including Catholic ones, who just don't recognize the amount of flexibility that there is in language. You know, I just named multiple meanings for who pair. Now, we're agreed on what the hemon means. That's pretty clear. Um, although even there, you could debate. I mean, is he talking about just the elect, or is he talking about all mankind, or what? You know, um, But uh, there's no way you can get this proves that Christ's righteousness and exactly his righteousness and nothing else is imputed to us, because... It can mean all, all. It can mean on our behalf or for us. 
or in our stead, or it can mean, you know, to help us out. It can mean all kinds of different things. All you can say is from, from this preposition, because one of the things about prepositions in languages is they tend to be very vague. They tend to have multiple meanings. I mean, if you just think about the English preposition in, in the house means something very different than in America. And it means something very different than, uh, and on is another one, you know, um, their, their prepositions strangely just tend to have bunches of different meanings and that generates bunches of ambiguity. So all you can really say from Huper Hemon is that Christ be, being made sin, which is itself poetic because he didn't literally become, as even James admits, he didn't transubstantiate into an abstract quality like sin. You know, he, he remained a person. Um, as even James acknowledges, and I quoted him to, to document that, you can say that, that make him being made sin had something to do with us, but you can't tease out an exact nuance from it because the preposition is so vague and can mean so many different things, and mm. we don't have additional elements in the context that would force it to mean his righteousness was and only his righteousness and exactly his righteousness was imputed to us with nothing else involved. You just can't, the, the text under de, under determines that. And this is illustrated by the fact, this is something that not a lot of audience members would necessarily know, but that's why I brought it up, is this is one of the most debated passages in the New Testament. You read commentaries on this, and they ju- they've got all kinds of different proposals about what this means. I also think in that dialogue he had with N.T. Wright that this passage came up, or, or it might have mm-hmm. just been in a, yeah. in a quote that Wright gives in one of his books, but he said that uh, actually this verse is not evidence of a mere imputation paradigm, because if it were, then St. Paul wouldn't have said that we become the righteousness of God mm-hmm. in him. He would have used a different word than we become. We becoming it actually kind of denotes that it doesn't say that it's not imputed, but it also implies that it's also transformative. Yeah. So so this did come up in a, in an exchange that N.T. Wright had with James on the Unbelievable podcast out of Great Britain. Um, and if I understand N.T. Wright's position correctly, um, basically he's proposing that the phrase righteousness of God means here what it commonly means in other places, where it essentially refers to the faithfulness of God, not a quality of righteousness that is bestowed on individuals. That would be a righteousness that comes from God, but he means God's own faithfulness. Mm. And so in T. Wright's understanding of this passage, if I understand him correctly, would not have righteousness come into us from God at all. Instead, it's saying, no, we become God displaying his trustworthiness, his oh. righteousness, God's fulfilling his promises, and that shows how God is faithful and trustworthy, and God is righteous because he's doing this for us. Okay, that's an interesting interpretation, but I want to stick with what can be shown, not what's an interesting possibility that would be convenient for me. Mm. And so rather than adopt N.T. Wright's understanding here, what I did in the debate was say, well, this passage may envision righteousness coming to us from Christ, but it's not identical to his own personal infinite righteousness. Otherwise, God would have to treat me exactly like Christ, and frankly, I'm not going to have the name above every name. Um, so, so I acknowledged implicitly N.T. Wright's position by saying this may mean this other thing. I didn't say it does mean that righteousness is coming to us from Christ, but it may mean that because that's a possible interpretation. So another big point that came out in this second debate had to do with the once for all nature of Christ's sacrifice, Mm -hmm. as well as the outworking of the power of that sacrifice over Mm -hmm. time. Because White emphasized that Hebrews, specifically Hebrews 10, teaches that Christ's once-for-all sacrifice perfected those for whom it was made. And yet you argue that, in principle, both the Catholic and the Reformed Baptist uh, viewpoints are kind of in the same boat with respect to having once-for-all aspects Mm -hmm. and aspects that are unfolding over time. Can you explain this further and, and how you showed this? Yeah, so um, so in the Protestant community, um, 
it is, and especially in the Calvinist community, it's common to distinguish between justification and sanctification. And justification is usually conceptualized as a way, as a moment in time where God makes us righteous, um, at least legally, maybe more than legally. And then sanctification is understood as a process by which God makes us holy, and holy and righteous are almost the same thing. So there's in the Bible, there's not really a sharp line between justification and sanctification. And consequently, Catholics tend to use the two terms interchangeably um, because the Bible just isn't rigid on this. But in Calvinism, they are rigid on this. And this is one of those quarrels about words that I wanted to avoid here by saying, look, we both agree God's making us legally righteous and he's transforming us so that we become experientially righteous too. And we're both agreed the same stuff's happening. It would be a quarrel about words to insist that if you don't use these words exactly this way, even though we agree on what God is doing, well, that would be a quarrel about words. And so one of the things I wanted to do is show, yeah, there is a finished, once for all finished aspect to Christ's work. That's what he did on the cross. But there's an ongoing work now. Jesus is not unemployed today. The the New Testament repeatedly talks about him being up in heaven at the right hand of God, advocating and interceding for us. And I quoted passages to illustrate that. And so um, if you're going to be faithful to Scripture, you're going to have to say there's an ongoing aspect to Jesus' work. So what does that involve? Well, one of the things in Protestant language that it would definitely involve is sanctification. Because when we get justified, God doesn't snap his fingers and suddenly we're perfect, sinless human beings that are never tempted to sin. We have to grow in uh, holiness, in practical experiential righteousness over the course of the Christian life. And Protestants acknowledge that. So there is definitely an ongoing progressive application of God's grace to us in this life. The um, And... and we can both agree on that, and so that's what I was going for. Now, James then is going to say, oh, but the uh, the sacrifice of the Mass is, uh, you, you're not perfected if you need the sacrifice of the Mass, or if you need to go to confession for sins, or if you need to, okay, all of this is just the outworking of, of, of Christ's uh, work on the cross. It's the application of the graces that he gave us. And I don't see how you deny that, because otherwise you'd have to say things like, you know that progressive sanctification that we get as as we walk with God and grow and mature as Christians? Um, that's in competition and undermines the once-for-all work of Christ. Well, nobody says that. So obviously, things where grace from the cross that is applied to us over time do not compete with the finality of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. They are an application of what he did in that once-for-all event. And I recognize that, and Protestants, when they're thinking about sanctification, recognize that. But for some reason, James wouldn't recognize that, and even when asked about it. No, that was a big, in-principle point to make, because he did make it sound that anything that adds to that once-for-all finished aspect of Christ's work anything that you want to say is tacked on or is required and, and so forth um, would be denigrating to that work or would demean it or would be, you know, going against um, God's plan or, or, or the gospel that Paul teached. And what you were able to point out is, well, no, both paradigms Ooh, I like have that this modernization. I like that, of, that verb modernization that Paul teached. You applied <laughs> a contemporary rule instead of doing the older English middle vowel shift of, from teach to taught. Paul taught. That's what happens when I try to speak too quickly. That Paul taught. and it's Very chic and nouveau of you. Oh, oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And to see that both sides have that aspect, though, um, is very helpful. Because then at least you have to be open to Catholic theology in, on its own terms, presenting what the Mass means to us. It's not just like, oh, you have this extra thing, and we have no extra things. It's no, both sides have a once-for-all aspect and things that are unfolding over time. How were you able to press this in the cross-examination, though? Because this came up with questions about being experientially righteous that I yeah. thought were particularly helpful. This came up, so in terms of the cross-examination, I should probably mention what I started with, because yeah. um, my 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 
oh, I'm now, now and I'm having a brain freeze. I guess we're all prey to those. Um, I know what it was. I asked him because one of the things I'd established early, early on was that John Calvin agreed mm. that saving faith includes love. He didn't even want to call it faith if it didn't include love. And so I said, do you agree with John Calvin that, that saving faith includes love? And he said, yes. And I said, so then you would agree with Pope Benedict XVI mm -hmm. that Luther's formula, faith alone, is true if it means faith working through love, correct? Well, he didn't want to agree to that because he disagrees with Pope Benedict on other things. And I said, look, I understand you disagree with Pope Benedict on other things. I'm just saying, do you, it looks like you agree on this one point. And he, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't affirm that. So this was the first, right out the gate, He's he's showing a question avoidance. He's avoiding answering the questions in a direct and obvious way, given what I've just established about what he believes, because he agrees with Calvin. Why doesn't he agree with Benedict? Why won't he affirm that? Um, so I shifted and said, uh, do you agree? Because I'd already been through the Council of Trent and its ninth canon. I said, do you agree with um, uh, that? Uh, with the Council of Trent's ninth, ninth Canon, when it says that we are not justified by intellectual assent alone. And he agreed with that. And so I said, headline, James White agrees with the Council of Trent. And, um, and I said, joking, joking. But I was also, it's like, kind of sending a message of, dude, be straight with me. If he had said, yes, I agree with Pope Benedict, I would have said, great. And I would have moved on. But it's like if you're trying to avoid a straight up, I agree with Benedict on this one point, I'm going to get you to say something else that will be more embarrassing. You know, like James White agrees with Council of Trent. If your concern is you don't want to be represented as agreeing with Benedict on one point, then I'll get you on something else. So just be straight with me, dude. Don't, don't play games. You know, just acknowledge the truth. You agree with Benedict on this. And he agrees with the Council of Trent on this. So the, uh, both of those are great. Um, I also, and someone who was rather cheeky, um, took a section of this cross-examination where, and this is, gets further down the line towards where uh, we're headed on the experiential, uh, experiential thing. Yeah. Um, th I saw someone on Twitter took a clip and titled it, James White Accidentally Proves Purgatory. Because I said, so James, do you agree that um, that not everybody is totally experientially righteous at the end of this life? And he's like, of course. And I said, so do you agree that um, in heaven, everybody will be totally experientially righteous? He's like, of course. So it seems that between death and heaven, something must happen that takes a person from being not completely experientially righteous to being experientially righteous. And he, uh, he, he, now this is obviously related to purgatory, but he, again, was trying to avoid the clear implication of his own admissions. And so he, he balked at that point and would not say that some thing, that's all I asked him to agree to, some thing happens. Um, <clears throat> and, and he, he started bringing in irrelevant topics that I hadn't brought up, like satis passio and temporal punishments and all kinds of things. And he said, and these are the dogmatic teachings of the church. And I said, actually, no, they're not. And I don't think you know what that term means. I was not planning to say that. That was an honest reaction because things like satis passio, that is, that's a theological speculation, about how purgatory works. It is not a dogmatic teaching of the church. And so he was doing what, unfortunately, a lot of non-experts do, which was confusing what's dogma with what's just theological opinion. Um, it seemed it, like he brought up a lot of that. Mary is the neck which turns the head of God's yeah, grace. Is that like a dogmatic a, teaching? No, of course not. That's some poetic expression that someone came up with in a prayer or something. And, and, you know, I could find all kinds of loony sound and stuff, you know, if I scoured through Protestant literature looking for embarrassing quotes um, or quotes that will be misunderstood by people of another communion. Um, <clears throat> in any event, he, he wouldn't bite on – even I had another go at it, and he just would not agree that something must happen between death and, and heaven 
that make that perfects you in righteousness. Um, so I said, okay, uh, let's talk about uh, forgiveness of sins. Do you believe that all of your sin? Notice how, by the way, what I'm doing is I'm asking him specific questions that only require yes or no answers. Yes. A, as a way of setting up more important questions. So I and he would often ramble for a second, and you know, which is to some extent understandable. But instead of just saying yes or no, he would typically give more than that. Um, but I, so I said, do you believe all of your sins are forgiven past, present and future? And he said, yes. And I said, do you say the Lord's prayer? Uh, and he said, yes. And I said, well, I'm, how can you, uh, can you explain to me why you say the Lord's prayer when the Lord's prayer includes the petition, forgive us our debts or in Luke's version, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who, who sin against us. Because it, if you've already been forgiven of all of your sins, you're not sincerely asking for new forgiveness when you say this prayer. And he had a weird transtemporal um, explanation for how he can continue to say the Lord's Prayer, even f- asking for forgiveness, even though he's not asking for forgiveness at the time he's saying the prayer. And it was bizarre. It's con- it's contrary to the obvious sense of the prayer, which any person in the audience would have, unless you're imposing this weird transtemporal idea onto it. And so I let that pass. You know, it's like, okay, he's just proposed some really weird thing that most of the audience probably didn't catch and isn't going to be inclined to find persuasive. So I shifted the question to a related one, and I said, so in um, in 1 John, it says John is writing, and he says, I'm writing to you, my children, so we know this is Christians he's talking mm. to, that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, then we have an advocate with Christ. Would you agree that when we commit new sin, it requires new action on the part of Jesus, our advocate. And he said, no. And I said, well, it sounds like you disagree with John. And he denied that he was disagreeing with John, because of course he was. Of course he's going to say that. But at this point, we basically ran out of time. And so um, I think, especially with the second debate, I was able to... um, to show that James either would need to agree with multiple points uh, uh, of Catholic compatible teaching that he didn't want to agree to that were clearly implied by things he already agreed to, or he would uh, he would he would refuse to admit them when he obviously did agree and he was just avoiding saying that. Um, or he was proposing really weird explanations for why he wouldn't agree. And so I think I was able to successfully demonstrate problems in his position. So we're nearing the end of our time here, Jimmy, but this mm-hmm. has been a, an, an excellent debrief. I just want to ask one other quick question about the second debate, and then we'll, we'll get into some concluding thoughts, which is this. Mm-hmm. So because you took that conciliatory approach and showing how Catholic faith properly understood can actually affirm um, the propositions or the resolution, some people are going to say, well, that obscured the differences between Catholics and Protestants on issues like justification and sanctification. And after all, aren't those differences important? So how would you respond to that? Well, I'd respond in a few ways. The first one is uh, is differences come in different magnitudes. Uh, if you're in a Catholic context, you probably don't want to go around using the formula of faith alone because it'll be misunderstood. But if you are talking to uh, people who use that expression, you don't want to falsely represent the Catholic Church by saying you can't use that phrase when in fact you can. Uh, one of the things about debates and dialogues is we're trying to get at the truth here, and that means not that means not falsely representing one side. Uh, It means, in fact, being able to translate into the language of both sides so that we don't quarrel about words and we do understand where there are and aren't differences. That means you need to take an approach where you look for common ground. In fact, I do this in every debate I do. I look for the common ground because by talking about common ground, um, I do a couple of things. I, one, show people of the opposing position that I'm a reasonable guy. 
that I'm willing to grant them where we agree. We don't, we, we agree on this stuff and that shows my reasonability where we agree. It also means we don't need to waste time fighting about that stuff. So it has the effect of focusing our attention on where there are remaining differences, which is what we need to talk about. Um, so the idea that I should mask Catholic truth in order to magnify differences, that's just a different form of obscuring the truth about the Catholic Church. And uh, I'm not going to obscure the truth about the Catholic Church for the sake of tribal chest thumping. Um, I'm here to try to build bridges, because that's how you win people for Christ. And so um, where there are distinctions, like, for example, it, I'm not going to build a bridge over does baptisms save you or not. I'm going to say baptism saves you. In, in, in fact, I, I, in, in, I said it nicely, but in the second debate, I was someone asked in the question period, so what do you need to do to get justified? I said, well, you need to repent, believe, and be baptized. And I know this is a Baptist church, I said, but I th I'm pretty sure that 1 Timothy 3.21 is in your Bibles, and it says baptism Peter. now, uh, 1 Peter 3.21 is in your Bibles, and it says baptism now saves you. And um, so, you know, I'm not watering that down. I'm not going to water down that it's possible to lose salvation. Instead, what I did was I pointed to all the Protestants, including General Baptists and Free Will Baptists, who believe it's possible to lose your salvation. So I'm not watering down any truths. What I will do is um, focus on where we do agree as a way of clearing the decks on those, and then we can talk about remaining disagreements. As to remaining disagreements, the Joint Declaration on Justification itself addresses those, and it says there are some remaining differences here, but they should not be church dividing. And so, well, okay, that's the position the magisterium has taken. I want to think with the church, yeah, there are differences here, uh, and we shouldn't deny those. Like if someone is saying you can't lose your salvation, well, that's just false. And I'll show you why that's false, but that doesn't mean I should be condemning someone else as teaching a false gospel, because actually this is a subsidiary question. It's not really part of the gospel. The gospel, once again, is God has sent his son to introduce his reign and to redeem us and so forth. That was a powerful part of your closing presentation in the second debate to say that if the accusation is that the Catholic Church is preaching a false gospel for you know this condition, mm -hmm. then or denying this, well, then also these all of these denominations are preaching a false gospel. Or if it's because of this, then it's you know all these other denominations and kind of saying, well, because we don't yeah. think that Lutherans and Presbyterians are different ones in different ways. However, it was segmented in your chart because we don't believe that they are necessarily preaching a false gospel, we shouldn't think the Catholic Church is either. I thought that was helpful. Thank you. Yeah, this was something I, I, I very much wanted to do, because you have a selectivity on the part of many people in the Protestant community, where they'll say, oh yeah, the Catholic Church teaches a false gospel because they believe in baptism as, for, as a means of salvation, and that makes it a work. And so they contradict the gospel. Well, okay, you know who else does that? Lutherans. Methodists, Anglicans, all kinds of people in the Protestant community agree. You know, you're going to have to say, I mean, Martin Luther not only was firm about baptism being a means of salvation, he was downright rude to the people who disagreed with that. He, I mean, you read his longer catechism on this question of is it, does it make it a work? He is right, he is, well, he's Luther, but he's insulting towards the people that he, he who disagree with him. So he's very firm on baptism as a means of salvation. You're going to have to say Martin Luther himself was preaching a false gospel if you're going to if you're going to say the Catholic Church is preaching a false gospel for saying the same thing. So I'm so in that I was making an appeal to uh, consistency because most people in the Protestant community don't want to accuse all their fellow Protestants of preaching a false gospel. And so if you're not willing to accuse them of that because of point A or B or C, I named four different conditions, um, if you're not going to accuse your fellow Protestants of that, then you shouldn't, confuse, you shouldn't accuse us of that either. And we can rejoice in the, um, in the greater unity that we actually have. So let's close, Jimmy, with some short reflections. How do you think the debates went overall, and what's the importance of doing debates such as these? Before I do that, I want to follow up oh, on, sorry. Yep. On, on one thing that happened in the second debate that um, 
that I had seen some people wondering about. If you if you look at and this has to do with the uh, the Gish Gallup mm. issue, mm. Um, because some people have noted that okay, at the beginning of your first rebuttal, you're talking about a bunch of stuff that James said he wasn't going to talk about. Oh, that's right. Yes, yeah. I'm sorry. He said he said. You said that White brought up topics he said he wasn't going to talk about, but White said he never agreed to any such thing. I, yeah, I was going to ask yeah. you, what's the story there? Well, the story there is I was referring to what he had just said seven minutes earlier at the beginning of his opening statement. Uh, not his opening statement, his first rebuttal. He got up and sa- at the beginning of his opening rebuttal and said, oh, I've only got seven minutes. I don't have time to bring up the masses of propitiatory sacrifice and the sacramental priesthood and it, the immaculate conception and the assumption. I mean, he rattled off 13 things um, and said he didn't have time to bring them up. So this wasn't some pre-debate agreement. He just said right now, I'm not going to, I don't have time to bring these up. And so I got up to kind of set the stage for later this I, I got up at the beginning of my first rebuttal and said well i want to thank james for bringing up all those things that he says he doesn't have time to bring up and you know what i don't have time to bring them up either so um to quote ludwig wittgenstein that which we cannot speak of we must pass over in silence and if he hadn't brought them up again i would not have said anything further about them but then in his second rebuttal he gets up and says um, and, and introduces the same things. You know, he, he rattles off the same kind of topics, none of which are what we're here to debate. And he, he's just bringing them up to try to waste my time with a gish gallop. And so I said, well, uh, you know, James brought up those, uh, those same things that he said he wasn't going to bring up. Um, and, you know, I said, this is, you know, he's trying this overloading tactic. It's sometimes called a gish gallop. But the truth is, I, you know, I don't have time to respond to all these things. So I'm going to stick to the core principles. <clears throat> and anything you'd like to ask, any of these particulars you'd like to ask me about in the Q&A, in the cross-examination period, feel free. Because that'll waste his time because they're not actually what we're here to debate. That does help. That does help clear it up because some people were like, "Wait, did they have like a prearranged agreement where they no. weren't going to?" No, no, no. You were just referring to I what he re- said. Referring earlier. to what he just said minutes mm-hmm. earlier. Got it. Yeah. Got it. All right. Very good. Well, this has been almost about two hours of uh, the debrief, Jimmy Aiken. I think people should watch the debates if they mm-hmm. haven't yet. I think they'll learn a lot from them. Hopefully, they learned something here today uh, from this debrief discussion. But we'll just close with any any parting thoughts of yours about how you think the debates went and why you think debates like this are important. Well, I think that uh, I think that they went very well. I was very pleased with both of them. Um, I. I was pleased with the cross-examinations in both of them, and I was especially pleased with the cross-examination in the second one. In terms of engaging the issue, I engaged the issues that we were actually there to debate, and I don't think James did – I don't think he did substantive damage to to my positions. Uh, he may have made rhetorical points at various you know cases, but um, but I don't think he did anything to disprove any of the stuff I said. He he really tended to either just ignore evidence I'd given and just make assertions to the contrary, and 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 that's just disagreement. Disagreement is not arguing your case. You know, like when I when when I um, when I said it looks like you're disagreeing with John about Christ taking new action when we sin. You know, he said, "Well, I disagree." Well, uh, um, okay, but that doesn't, it still looks like you're disagreeing with John. Um, you haven't explained how how your view is compatible with what John said. So simply disagreeing is not argument. It's not offering evidence. And um, and he, he, he got on a bunch of rabbit trails. He brought up a bunch of stuff. Uh, he made a bunch of um, charges like equivocation that aren't accurate. So I don't, and he, and he didn't, he didn't, he didn't meet his burden of proof in either case. So I think, I think the debates went very well from my perspective in terms of why it's important to have them. Well, it, I, th- I think these two debates um, have different importances. The first debate where I took the negative case, I think was important because people need to understand that sola scriptura just isn't true. 
it does not meet its own test, and we need to be following the pattern that was used by the apostles and that they expected the first Christians to use. That pattern, that paradigm, has never been rescinded, and so it's still binding on us today. When it comes to the second debate, um, I think it was important because it showed a different side of Catholicism to the audience than what the audience has likely heard before. Um, the truth is, we are not as far apart on these issues uh, connected with justification as people think we are. And so it was good for Catholics to hear that in the audience, and it was good for Protestants to hear that in the audience. And so this was a chance to shine a light on some good news for once in the Christian community. Fantastic. Well, I think you did a, uh, a terrific job, Jimmy Aiken, of defending the Catholic viewpoint, and I appreciate you coming on to discuss and debrief both of these fascinating debates. Thanks so much for joining me again today. It's been a blast. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. And before we go, just one more reminder that if you like what you've watched, you can help me out by liking, commenting, and especially subscribing to this channel. I'm trying to grow it, and I'd really appreciate your help. Thank you, and God bless.